Hey, it's John Mike, brew-dudes.com. These brew dudes, however you want to say it, this is the first installment of our first plucking from the jar of destiny. This is British Strong Ale. Woo! Now, uh, I didn't know what we were getting into once we started choosing beer styles out of a jar, but uh, here we are. Now we get to taste beer. Um, so, Mr. Mike, did you want to ask me about my thoughts on, yeah, so on this style? I pulled British Strong Ale. So the first question I want to ask is, um, for you, is going into this, you know, what what do you think your expectations are? What do you know as a home brewer about I, British I don't, Strong Ale? Really what are your assumptions is the question? Yeah, yeah, I don't really know anything. Um, I, I was wondering if that was a, a style they renamed for 2015 or something, <laughs> number one. And then... Number two, if you were to ask me my assumptions, well, I'm guessing it's a British ale in the thought that there's like a good smashing uh, amount of uh, crystal malt in there. Um, strong probably indicates that the alcohol level is a little high, but then, you know, followed with a lot of great English variety hops. So lots of like earthy, spicy notes to go along with some um, nice uh, caramel sweetness to go along with it. That's my that's my assumptions. Yeah, cool. So I didn't really know what to expect either because British Strong Ale has never been something that's on my radar. But um, so I started to dig into what it was. And I, had, I remember when we pulled the nickel, I think, oh, it's British Strong Ale. So what does that mean? 6% alcohol? Right? I, I yeah, remember sure. saying that, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, as opposed to like if you had said like a strong American ale, you'd expect it to be like maybe 9%, 10%, right? But the BJCP actually lists British Strong Ale as having an alcohol of 55 to 8%. Okay. So <laughs> that's so, a wide range. So that's sort of like where I started with my idea of how to research this. I look at the BJCP first, just those vital statistics, to start figuring out how big of a beer we're talking right, about. Good. Sorry. And that, that's okay. Spoiler, spoiler alert. And then, <laughs> Sorry, that's good. And so then um, then I went and I scoured like two or three of the those like recipe database pages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Typing in, uh, you know, looking for British Strong Ale to get a sense of what other people were doing. Um, then I went back to the stock guidelines and I looked at the commercial examples. And one of the commercial examples, strangely enough, which is Sam Smith's uh, Winter Welcome Ale. I actually had one of these I'm in my welcome. fridge. So that's what the, this beer is here. Huh. So in this example for researching it, I was able to taste this and then go, do, go online and do some, some reading, a little more reading about the style. And for me, um, what I really came to with this style, right, is that it's going to be a little bit more over the top malty than like your other British bitters, yeah. your British pale yeah, ales. Yeah. You're going to have a hot balance to to um, to support all that stuff, and then there really should be a strong English yeast, yeast character too. And this is all yeah. uh, just a little bit bigger than other uh, British ales, but not as big as an um, as an English barley wine. Yes, right. Not as big as like a, a big English stout, things like that. Yeah. Um, there was one reference somewhere where they talked about maybe it was actually in the BJCP. It's actually very simple. All the statistics have a very similar overlap with the uh, old ale, yeah. except it's not aged. Got it. Right? So, so it's fresh. It's fresh. Mm. So um, so anyway, so let's just get to it um, from there. So here's the recipe. Now I'll put the full recipe with real numbers and stuff yes. in the style guidelines just to not have these Jar of Destiny videos get too long. Yeah, we're keeping it brief for the right. tasting, but uh, if you want the full details, look in the description below. But let's start with the water for this. So the water for this, I used I used our tap water for this because it being British, yeah. I knew I wanted to have a higher chloride to sulfate ratio. Yep. So we've got a tremendous amount of chloride in our water. Yep. Um, so what I did is I just added six grams of gypsum in the kettle yep. in order to get myself to a two to one chloride to sulfate ratio. So in the end, I had 264 chloride and 142 ppm of sulfate. But I also added enough to get myself to a little over around 110 parts per million of calcium because our, our water is pretty devoid of calcium. Yep, so, true. so that worked there to get me to that quality for the water. Um, and then the, the basic recipe, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through the the parts of the recipe and really why I picked them in the recipe, right? So this being a big British ale, um, obviously I had to go with Maris Otter as the base malt. So that should be no surprise. <laughs> yeah. But Maris Otter, because it has that very unique British ale character to it, it's biscuity, it's somewhat nutty, but um, I've never found it to be super intense. And it's just that it's it, it definitely has its own character, but you really need that in a British, any British style. Um, then the next two ingredients, so that's 93% of the grain bill. And then it's about 3% each of the next two ingredients. I went with amber malt, which is a 22 uh, love a bond malt. Amber malt is supposed to sort of be sort of like a, um, 
a slightly sweeter version of like a real biscuit malt. Mm. We're supposed to have an intense, toasty biscuit flavors. I got it. And then I found this other malt that I'd never used before, but I think they use it in this in this and some other commercial examples I could find too online is um, double roasted crystal malt. Oh, okay. From Simpsons. Yeah. And I'd never used that before. And double roasted crystal malt is about 152 level mm. bond. Mm. So, and that's going to give you some of the slightly deeper sugar character, yep. but again, deliver a pretty intense biscuit yeah. thing to it. Um, for the hops with this one, I actually went with two ounces of Challenger, the bitter. Okay. And I also went with then uh, for 60 minutes, and then I did an ounce of EKG. You have to go EKG here. Um, I went with a very traditional 30 minute edition with one ounce and then with 10 minutes left in the boil, another ounce Got of EKG. Nice. So what I'm trying to do there is have plenty of IBU to support what's going to be, this is like where my personal preference came into, right? Is that knowing I was going to try to pile in as much biscuit multi flavors as possible. Um, I wanted to make sure I had enough bitterness so it didn't come over as just being a malty mess. Yep. Um, so that's why two ounces of Challenger at 6% six alpha, 6 alpha acid, just really make sure I had enough IBU there to struggle through all that biscuitiness. Um, and then the East Kent Golding is just to give you that East Kent Golding British ale aroma and flavor. Yep. And of course I finished this off and the yeast that they use in this and in many other examples is the London ESB ale strain. Yep. I used Y yeast 1968. I did do a starter with that. So my original gravity on this beer when I brewed this was um, 1056. No, I'm sorry, 1060. And then I fermented it down to um, 1013. So the basic strength on this guy was about six and a half percent. I was trying to go for something stronger than what I'm used to in terms of the bitter category. I didn't want to have an eight percent beer. Yep. Um, so I went for something that I knew would be a little bit stronger that if you had like two or three pints of this, you'd be pretty happy about it. You'd be feeling it, but it, you wouldn't be overwhelmed by it. Yeah, I know. Um, so, it's so drinkable though. <laughs> so, that's, so that's what I did. And I fermented it um, nice and cool. It's the perfect time in this basement yeah. to be fermenting these things. So I didn't have any active temperature control. I just, I had chilled the wort down to about uh, 63, 64 pitched my yeast and then it came up to about 65 68 in this basement and then with a couple days left when I, I take a little sample I tasted it and it, it's hard with British yeasts to know if you're getting too much diacetyl or mm. is it just all that malty yeasty character before it's really had a chance to settle out um, I think some the yeast can taste a little bit diacetyl so I put the brew belt on it just to get it up to about 72 for like two days Killed it, kegged it, let it cool, carbonated it, and here we are. So I am thirsty. I'm going to take yeah, a Yeah, you should because it's tremendous. Um, like all the things that you talked about in the descriptions, I think you're hitting it. Um, it's well balanced, you know, and you, you talk about the perfect uh, time of the year to be fermenting this beer. This is like the perfect time to be drinking it too. Oh, you yeah. Know? It's like a total season changer. Uh, type beer where like things are warming up here in the uh, northern hemisphere um, but it's not uh, you don't it's not warm enough for any kind of like summer beers or anything like that yeah it's I've always nice thought about there. this time of year like you start thinking about like those spring transitions because like a red ale or a, mm. or maybe like a dunkel would be nice things like that I would never have really thought British strong ale to slide that into the repertoire oh. going from spring into uh, winter into spring yeah maybe this is a is a late winter yeah. <laughs> as we are right now so what's interesting yeah. is actually the style guidelines, it's, it actually does have a pretty broad range. The color on this uh, for the BJCP, they actually let you go from uh, 8 all the way up to 22. Okay. So this beer can go all the way to like that light brown ale yeah. character. Yeah. Um, and in here they make reference to certain uh, commercial breweries actually using this general guideline as... Um, uh, as like their their winter beer or like a, a holiday style ale, yep. right? Yep. Um, and so, well, I love this color. I think this color is is naturally like yeah. This is one of those when, spot on when you see it. I'm like, okay, yeah, this is where I want to be. Um, on the nose, um, and like the head is is beautiful. It's got some lacing on it. It's sticking. Um, on the nose, a lot of malt character. Some of that burnt sugar you were talking about. Maybe that's coming from that amber malt mm -hmm. you were saying. Um, Trying to get, detect any of the uh, little bit of little bit of the hop, but yeah, it's it's the hop aroma is drowning in yeah. the malt profile. Yeah, exactly. But but okay. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, I don't mind it at all. Um, and uh, the the challenger is there in the aftertaste, 
I mean, it is, it is, it's fighting its way through. Yeah. You know, there's it's a lot. Fun, it's fun, actually. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's there. But um, it's just like, it's just a wonderful blend of that biscuity, that graham cracker, as you, as you always call it, um, malty background with all of, all, all the different malts you're putting in and the Maris Otter that's there. Yeah. That's like doing its thing, like mm -hmm. to like be the foundation on top of all these specialty malts you put yeah. in there. Um, could you put in even more EKG, like for some of that spiciness? Yeah. <laughs> maybe. Or maybe move that 30 minute edition closer to the 10 yeah. just to get you. Yeah, a little bit. Get it on the nose, really. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. But maybe like, how many, like, so did, I don't know, you didn't say like specific amounts, but would you add more to those late uh, hop additions? Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're both at one ounce a piece, but maybe bumping them up another 20% to like an ounce and a quarter, a little bit less than an ounce and a quarter uh, each would. would would give you more EKG character. Yeah. Um, who knows? Or maybe just bunk, taking both the 30 minute edition, just rolling it all into the 10 minute edition, or maybe just doing two ounces of 15 minutes. Yeah. Or, you know, somewhere that's just playing with it. You know? Yeah. But I don't know, man. I mean, I, so in the style. Or maybe just another edition at Flame Out. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. I and don't want to, I don't want to drift into like that being an American making strong <laughs> British ale and dry, you know, getting close to dry. We just need to add more hops to it. Yeah. Uh, so in the style guidelines, it say like it's it's definitely like a malt forward beer. Oh yeah, yeah. The uh, the flavor is medium to high malt character, oh. often rich with nutty toffee caramel. Flavors. Okay, you, I think you nailed that. So, so some <laughs> versions they actually use brewing sugars too. Oh, okay, and I debated that. I was gonna. I was thinking about. I was trying to see if I could source some some uh, treacle. Yes. Right. Treacle. Treacle. treacle yeah. Treacle. Um, <laughs> I thought about using molasses, but we know how that went um, last well, time. We liked that. I, we liked it. Yeah. We liked it. But I. But for this, for this experiment, you know, like, like how much molasses to use, I didn't want to. Nah. I was getting nervous. Um, well, I thought about maybe getting some like amber candy sugar, maybe. Yeah. Uh, that's all fair game in this style. It's, yeah. the, 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 when you read these guidelines, it's actually pretty broad interpretation. It's meant to be something that's more than your bitters, and not quite, but not quite. You know, barley wine, it's it's just something in there, you know, um, to fit in that that gravity space, you know, of what it is. Um, so, yeah, some some brewers use use brewing sugars and I really debated it. I wanted to do it, um, but then I was I was really curious to see how that double roasted crystal malt would play. And I didn't want to mask that over with the brewing sugars. Yep. I think that this is so malty as it is that any brewing sugar in there, too, even if there was a residual essence of like, um, just that burnt sugar type of taste to it, it would probably just be too much. And then we'd really be talking about wishing there were more hops. In there. <laughs> right? Just yeah, to help balance it. Yeah, you know? exactly. So, so very nice, very nice. The I, only thing, the only, I'll just add one more thing. The only thing with this is that I've, I I picked up a relatively out. significant chill haze. It hasn't gone away. And I don't, I think I just need to maybe have boiled it a little harder. Um, I did use Werflock and, and did all oh, that. Wow. I didn't gel gelatinize the keg. I mean, I might try that now that we've tasted it just to see if I can drop some of that haze out. It's gotten a little clear over time, but it it is mostly chill haze because when I transferred it to the keg, it was crystal clear. Yeah. So it's definitely chill haze. That's the only detractor. Um, who knows? Maybe it's, maybe it's just some aged amber malt, aged crystal malt is from the supplier. I can't control that. And so. I was just hoping that two weeks of quarantine would get us some clear <sighs> beer. clear British oh, well. beer. Oh, well. Dude, big success on the, uh, you know, <laughs> cheers. Cheers. On the uh, Jar of Destiny beer number one. So if you have had some experience with this style or have some pointers that, uh, um, you know, from either drinking commercial versions of it or you've brewed it yourself, drop them in the comments below. Uh, one, one wrinkle I wanted to give to you, sir, okay. is that since we're brewing these styles, we should probably get some kind of independent feedback. Drop them in the competition. Let's drop them in the yeah, competition. Yeah, we should. We will definitely. All right. Do that. All right. Yeah. Well, then we'll do the same thing for my black IPA, which is next week. Um, if you like this video, give us a thumbs up. Subscribe to our channel because we do this kind of thing every single week for John and Mike. These brew dudes, brew on. Cheers.